In this lesson, we will look at hydrographs and fluvial landforms, which form part of the geography syllabus. So a hydrograph is simply a graph which shows the runoff in a river channel at a certain time, normally after a period of rainfall or before a period of rainfall. Now, before the storm or before your rainfall occurs, the discharge is made up of groundwater only. As we've learned, rivers are fed by base flow from the water table. And if there's no rain, then all the water in the river is coming from your base flow, which is from your water table. Now, after the onset of the storm, you have no initial increase in discharge. This is simply because your water has to saturate the soil before there's runoff into the uh, river channels. Your water has to reach your water table via infiltration before it can enter the river as base flow. And your water takes time to travel through channels in order to reach the point at which you are measuring your discharge. So if we look at a typical hydrograph, we have one over here. We've got our rainfall measured in, in millimeters on our axis over here. Uh, sorry, over here is our rainfall and our discharge is measured in cubic meters per second on our larger axis over here. Now, if we look at our rainfall, we look at, we have a onset of a storm over here, as we see we have rainfall. And there are a number of points on the hydrograph that you need to know how to label and you need to know what they are. So first we look at the lag time. Your lag time is the time between the period between the maximum amount of rainfall as we can see this is your maximum amount of rainfall here and your peak flow or discharge so this would be your lag time over here your time between your peak rainfall and your peak discharge your peak flow or your flood peak is where the ri river reaches its highest level now this is this would be your bank full discharge so all of this over here would be above your bank and therefore your flooding flow as labeled here Bank full discharge, as we've see it, said, is when the river's water level is at the top of its channel and starts to overflow, which we've labeled here. Our storm flow is simply everything above our base flow, which has occurred due to the rainfall. And our base flow is why, where our river discharge would have been flowing had there been no rainfall. Now you can see there is a slight increase in our base flow after the onset of the storm and this is because water infiltrates into the soil enters our water table and we have more base flow into the river there are a number of factors that affect our hydrograph we can look at the shape of the basin a larger basin will have a more a more spread out discharge because the water takes longer to reach your position of measurement the shape of your basin will change that too your relief, a steeper steeper um, gradient, will give more runoff and therefore larger discharge. Human impact, more urbanized areas have larger runoff and it will give a higher peak and a quicker peak because you do not have to infiltrate your soil. And vegetation cover, of course, will do the same thing by affecting your infiltration and your runoff. Climatic features, if you have a lot of rainfall, you will have a larger flooding peak or hydrograph peak and your type of rock and soil will also play a role if you have permeable rock you'll have more infiltration leading to less runoff and a slower peak so your peak would be later on and possibly lower then we look at the Hallstrom curve which is new to the syllabus however it has been tested in exams that I have seen and written it's very easy to understand we look at a Hallstrom curve it's an indication of the the speed at which particles will be moved, eroded, and deposited. So if we look over here, we have velocity. So if we take sand, which is 0 0.1 millimeters to 1 millimeter, up until about a velocity of 1, they will be deposited. Anything above that to about a velocity of 30 cubic centimeters per second, we would transport the particles and anything above that, the particles will be eroded. And then obviously for each type, you simply read it off like that. Any, any number within your deposited, the pebble or cobble or boulder will be deposited. Anything within the yellow region will be transported and anything above that will be eroded. 
So it's also good to note that despite the small size, your clay particles, which we see over here, they take a high velocity to be eroded and that is due to the fact that they are cohesive they stick together and therefore they require a high velocity to be eroded then we move on to fluvial processes so in your upper course you've got very turbulent flow due to your steep gradient and normally we get waterfalls rapids and gorges in our upper course and we have a very deep and v-shaped uh, river channel in our middle course, we have more laminar flow. We have meanders, floodplains, alluvial fans, interlocking spurs, and we have a much shallower and wider river channel. When we look at our lower course, we have marshes, meanders, oxbow lakes, levees, and braiding, and we have a much wider and much more spread out shallow river channel. When we simply compare them in our upper course, we have a deep narrow channel with vertical erosion, steep gradient, and low volume with little load. In our middle course, we have a wider, shallower channel. As we've said, we have lateral erosion, gentle gradient, and load and volume increase. And in our lower course, we have a broad, flat channel, as we can see over here, with deposition, gentle, flat gradient, and increased volume and load. Now, when we look at fluvial landforms, this is a large sec section within this topic, and you will often be asked to draw an example or to explain an example and how it forms. The river changes the landscape by eroding or depositing. Whether it erodes or deposit is dependent on the energy of the river. Now the energy of the river is determined by the velocity. The faster a river flows, the more energy it has to erode the landscape. The slower it flows, it loses energy and cannot carry the load and therefore deposits it. Now your volume will change that. The greater the volume, the faster the river flows and therefore there is more energy, more chance of erosion. Steeper gradient makes your river flow faster and therefore more energy. Again, greater chance of erosion and friction. A smoother riverbed will allow the river to flow faster with more energy leading to a higher chance of erosion. Now over here, if you're ever asked to draw a transverse profile, this is what they are asking for. And if you're ever asked to draw a longitudinal profile, this is what they are asking for. Here we would have our upper course, our middle course, and our lower course, upper course, middle course, and our lower course. So now we look at features of the upper course. So firstly, we look at waterfalls. Now this is a diagram of a waterfall. We have hard rock directly under the flow of the water. This can be caused from a sill or dikes as shown over here. We have soft rock underneath that, and this would be labeled as your plunge pool. So water plunges over a resistant layer of rock which cannot be eroded. As the water falls, the force of the water falling erodes the soft rock below. So this force of water over here erodes the soft rock. Through hydraulic action, which is a, a means of erosion, the soft rock below is eroded and undercutting occurs. The movement of the soft rock backwards towards the headwaters of the, sh of the river is known as undercutting. An overhang of resistant rock forms, as we can see over here, and the overhang will eventually collapse with time. And in this way, the process is repeated and the waterfall retreats upstream. As each overhang collapses, the waterfall then moves backwards. A steep sided gorge may be left in front of the waterfall as a result of the erosion. Then we look at rapids. Rapids simply, you have a hard rocky outcrop on your river bed from where the water flows over outcrops of resistant rock as we've said which is often uneven we have turbulent flow which is the vertical movement of water and potholes are caused due to erosion caused by the turbulent flow with eddies and bubbles then we look at the features of the middle course and the lower course we look at a meander so this is typically typically what your meander would look like on the outer edge the faster moving water as we can see here will occur. We, we label the fast moving water and the currents as the thal wig. Now this is just a term to refer to the faster moving water, which causes erosion and gives us a cut off slope or a river cliff. On the inside, we have the slow moving water, which means that the water deposits its load as it does not have enough energy to transport it. And therefore we get a gentler slope called a slip off slope. Your thalweg over here is fast moving water erodes the bank, moving the river bank further out. As this erodes, it erodes the land over here and your river moves left. 
Your deposition occurs here and this will also move left with a more gentle slope of deposition. Your erosion is lateral and vertical and in that way you will get a movement of your meander. So your thalweg, as we've said, is the fast moving water. This flows on the outside bank as we've labeled over here and the same thing would happen over here. Slow moving water is on the inside bank as we've labeled over here. And the outside bank, the thalweg, causes the erosion of the river bank. The erosion is both lateral and vertical. This makes the bank outward, moves the bank outwards to form the S shape as we've said. Undercutting of the bank causes a river cliff to form which is the steep cliff on the outer edge. And the types of erosion are hydraulic action, your force of your water, and abrasion, which is the force of the particles in the water on the river bank. On the inner bank, the slow moving water is unable to transport its load, and it deposits the load, forming a slip off slope, which leads to the S shape. Stream braiding, which would look something like this, or for, like this from above. Your river, which is carrying a heavy load, loses its energy due to flat gradient and deposits its silt which forms these little islands. As we can see here, this is simply deposited silt and your water will flow in between your islands. Your river starts to divide into a number of streams and gives a rope-like pattern. Your silt blocks your river's path, as we can see here. Here we look at interlocking spurs, which are not tested often, but are, are good to know about. So these would be your interlocking spurs over here, where your river cuts downwards to form a valley. Your valley is deepened by rocks carried by the river. Through abrasion, you have greater vertical erosion. As your river meanders, the spurs form on either side in a low-lying area, and your high-lying area forms your spurs. When you look at alluvial fans, simply when a stream leaves the hills and spreads out to become braided, so you would have a mountain over here, as the river leaves the mountain area, you will have a spreading out of the water. The speed of flow is reduced and sediment is deposited. We label the narrowest point of our apex, of, sorry, of our alluvial fan as the apex and the widest point as our apron. Then we look at features of the lower course. The most common feature is floodplains and levees. Floodplain is simply the flat ground in the lower course of a river which has fertile soil as the floods deposit sediment. So every time the river floods, deposit sediment, which is nutritious, and therefore the soil surrounding a floodplain is very fertile. When we look at levees, we'll have a river seen like this. In flooding, when the river is in flood, the sediment is deposited along the banks. The coarse sediment is deposited closest to the river because it cannot be transported and smaller sediments are carried further out. After numerous floods, you will have a building up of sediment on the banks of the river and this leads to the formation of natural levees. A levee is a natural riverbank formed along the sides of a river channel. So as we've said, the river floods and deposits material as we can see over here, indicated by the red. This would have been your river bank and it now built up due to the floods. Coarse materials deposited first and then fine material further along. And over time, the deposits from a natural the deposits from the flooding form a natural levee. Then we move on to Oxbow Lakes. So an Oxbow Lake, erosion occurs on the outer bank and deposition on your inner bank. This is explained in the same way as we've explained meanders with our thalweg and our slow moving water. So we would have deposition on the inner on the inner bank due to slow moving water and erosion on our outer banks over here and over here due to our fast moving thalweg. The loop is then through this action, our loop moves in and this loop moves in due to erosion, this moves in and due to erosion, this moves in. And eventually we have lateral erosion where the two points will meet each other. The neck of the loop becomes narrow due to erosion. The neck is finally cut through by erosion and allows water to flow a more direct route as we can see over here. So if you were to explain this, you'd explain it using your thalweg causing erosion, moving these two together. I'll slip off slope with deposition and slow moving water over here. And in that way, the two move together and eventually break through, giving a new straight river course with an oxbow lake. Then we move on to deltas. 
Deltas are not often tested, but it's good to be able to identify them and explain them. Your deltas form under the following conditions. When the river slows down and loses its energy as it enters a sea or a lake. When the sea does not have strong enough currents to remove the deposited material from the river. And when the river is heavily silted and carries a large load of sediment. Now there are four time, types of deltas. If you look at an arcuate delta, you can identify this as distributaries build new land. We can see new land being built on a coastline in an arc shape. When we look at a bird's foot delta, it simply resembles a bird's foot, and this is often the easiest to identify. Estuarine delta is very shallow, wide, open river mouth. As we can see here, this is a very shallow, we can see the sand beneath the river water, and your distributaries form in the river mouth, as we can see. Cuspate delta is simply the river mouth is open and distributaries do not form sediment is deposited along a, sing a single channel as we can see here our sediment is now deposited along a single channel. Now in order to explain how a delta forms we would simply outline that the river slows down deposits its load sediment blocks the river's path and forms distributaries and deltas create new land.